With that said, I invite you to open up a copy of God's Word with me to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. I will read the text for us together, and then we will begin our time together. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 reads as following. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer as we go before our Heavenly Father and ask for his help as we come to his word? Father, we give you great thanks here on this evening as we have celebrated the Lord's Day, as we have taken the time to set our hearts on your worship and on rest. And now as we close out this day together as the church, we pray that you would speak to us through your word. God, we have come not to hear the opinions of man, but the unchanging word of God. So I pray that anything that is of me would be quickly forgotten and fall away. But that which is of your word, that which is eternal and true, may it dwell in us richly. We pray, God, that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive all that you have for us tonight. We have come longing to hear you speak, and here we are, Lord. And so we pray, by your spirit through the word, speak to us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, we are all familiar with running, and more specifically with races. You perhaps have run a race in your own history. Maybe you've ran a 5K or a 10K. Maybe if you are particularly gifted or uh, passionate about running, you've done a half marathon or even a marathon. Maybe you've done holiday races. You were looped into one, maybe uh, begrudgingly, something like a turkey trot or the hot chocolate 5K, 15K race in Chicago. Maybe you've never run a race yourself but maybe you've seen them. You've seen the people during the holidays running through downtown or running through your neighborhood and they kind of mess up all the traffic routes for you. And so because some people decide to run, you've got to drive 10 minutes longer wherever you're going for your errand. Maybe you haven't been in a race yourself. Maybe you haven't seen a race yourself, but I know this, you definitely know a runner who likes to race and do that often. I know this because anyone who is a runner loves to talk about being a runner. You know who you are. Everyone who really loves the sport of running loves to tell you about the sport of running. Specifically, they love to tell you about the races they themselves have ran. So all of us somewhere have an experience with races. We know what it's like. I have one story with regards to races that I like to share with people. It's very humiliating on my behalf. Uh, I used to run some races, smaller races, 5Ks, things that were small, insignificant. But I got looped in to running a half marathon, the Chicago Half Marathon in 2016, and I ran that thing with zero preparation. Now, let me just kind of set the stage for us. I am not a runner. I am not just habitually running regularly. I am not in the shape of a runner. I'm not able to just wake up one morning and go do a half marathon. But that's exactly what I did. I woke up that morning in 2016 in October, and I went and I ran the half marathon, and I finished that thing, but it was awful. And you can probably go find it. I'm not going to tell you where to go look, but it probably lives on the internet somewhere. You know the photos that they take of you along races? That Like every mile marker, there's a camera set up that takes pictures, and they associate with your bib number. You can go online and find every picture without fail of me from that race. I am have my hands on my hips. I am in pure agony. My face looks I I've just gone through a war. I just look like I'm in complete despair. I did not prepare. I did not give it the intentionality and the seriousness it required, and I paid dearly for it. Well, today, as we look at the book of Hebrews, we look at two verses. The author is going to use race-based language, running language, to describe the Christian life. And the intent of the author is that we might take up the call in this text seriously with intentionality that we might run the race of faith well. 
The author desires us to have a good experience in our race of faith, namely for us to be successful as we run. And so I want to spend our time together tonight in this passage with one main goal, that is I want to encourage you to run well. As we look at this text, as we look at running well in the Christian life, we're going to look at three distinct things. And so first, let's begin, we are going to look at ourselves. You'll notice our text has two main commands in it. He starts off by saying, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race set before us. Those are two imperatives being given in the text, two commands, and the first serves the second. The reason why we are being told to lay aside weights and sins is so that we might run the race with endurance. That is the main command. So the first thing we must look at, the author has us looking, is ourselves. We are the runner. And the author wants to put our eyes first on ourselves. Well, let's look together at the two commands. The idea of running with endurance is not something foreign to us. If you've been following Christ for any length of time, after first coming to faith, there's usually a spiritual high, as if it were, where you have great joy and happiness and you feel like there's nothing that could touch you. And then life begins to settle in. And over the years and decades of following Christ, what you find is that endurance is the absolute appropriate word of what you need if you're going to finish the race and do it well. And so the author wants to commend to us that there's a race to be run and we should run it with endurance. But the first command, specifically, is going after how we are to serve and do that command well. Namely, we are to lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Now notice there are two things being laid aside. Oftentimes we'll read this verse very quickly and we'll just kind of lump them together and we'll just kind of write it off as if it's saying you should not sin. Now to be sure, we're going to look in just a moment, it is saying that. But there are two distinct words being used in this verse for a particular purpose. You'll notice we are told to lay aside every weight and sin. Two distinct words mean two different realities. Sin, we know very Well, we know the different kinds of sins. We're familiar in Scripture how it speaks of it. Things like greed, anger, gossip, lust, deceit, pride, any form of idolatry that would seek to take us away from the true and living God and put our hearts into the things of this world. The author says, have nothing to do with it. If you're running a race and you're engaging in sinfulness in this Christian life, it's as if you are going backwards in the race. This is the kind of picture the author wants us to see. We're running a race. We're trying to be faithful. We're trying to endure with all the hardships that come our way. And to engage in sin is as if we are moving backwards, hindering our progress entirely. And so it's easy to understand why the author is trying to say, just set aside any sin. Do not be given over to such things. But this category of weight is a little bit different. This category of weight opens up a broader category for us as Christians. Simply put, if you are a runner, you know you might train in all kinds of different apparel and clothing, but when it's time to go running, you want to be as streamlined as you can. You don't want to be hindered by anything that's unnecessary or unhelpful. Simply put, you've never, I shouldn't say that, you probably have never seen someone running the Chicago Half Marathon or any other race wearing a fur coat or running in a full suit and tie. Because we understand such apparel would be very unhelpful for the task of running. It would be an unnecessary weight. It would be something that would be causing disruption to the task, not aiding and helping. That's what the author is getting after when he's talking about a weight. That we should not be adding anything onto us that is unhelpful for the race that we are set to do. Now, it's important for us to kind of stop and think about what this might look like in all of our lives. Simply put, the distinction between weight and sin shows us that the author is trying to make clear that not all weights are sinful. That things can weigh us down in the race of the Christian life and not be explicitly sinful things. If we're struggling with anger or gossip or lust or pride, those are clearly definitively sins. We should cast them aside, the author says. But we have not finished our work by simply saying no to sin. We must ask the question, how are we to run well? And there are things in this life, things in our lives, that if we are honest with each other and honest with ourselves, are not helpful for the Christian life, though they may not be explicitly sinful. 
And if we were to go through the room and I had time to do a deep dive with all of you into your personal lives and we could ask good questions, what we would find is many of us would struggle with many different things. There would be different categories of weights in our life. So here's just a couple of them. Perhaps entertainment is a weight for you in your life. We live in a culture which is completely consumed with entertainment. We are obsessed with amusement. And that word amusement, literally amusement, is the negation of any musing or serious thought. We just want to disconnect our minds and we want to focus on the screen. That's what we want to do in our culture nowadays. Well, perhaps Christian, maybe entertainment, amusement, has grown to be such a a large component of your life that it's actually serving as a weight in your Christian walk. Perhaps it's starting to be unhelpful. There's nothing wrong with watching a TV show or watching a movie or enjoying entertainment on a given night but it can be a category of a weight for us. How about another example that many of us might struggle with? Sports. Another form of entertainment, but a more explicit one. Many of us are obsessed with sports. Now, for those of you who know me well, you know I'm a big fan of sports. I'm a fan of the New England Patriots. I love sports, but there's a difference between enjoying sports, following sports, watching sports, and being a slave to sports. There's a difference between enjoying the game and being a slave to hearing every headline, every stat line, knowing every trade that's taking place. We have to be honest, especially men in this room, are sports becoming a weight in our Christian life? Another weight for many of us, perhaps in the younger categories in this church, social media. Again, there's nothing explicitly sinful with partaking in social media. I'm on Facebook But if we allow our hearts to be consumed by social media, if we find ourselves spending more and more time, hours upon hours of the day, we might find out that social media is serving as a weight in our souls. Simply put, if we could see how we spend our time throughout the day, where we spend our money, and where our thoughts often go to in moments of quiet, we probably would begin to see categories of even weights in our lives readily available to see. And the author wants us to recognize that if we're going to run the race well, and if we're going to have endurance, we need to lay aside both, yes, sin, but also any weight. The race itself is hard enough with all the trials and tribulations which will come our way, and so we must set these things aside if we are to run with endurance. The command is for Christians to take seriously the task of faith and to put as the foremost priority of life to be running the race well with intention to finish the race. That's the task of the author here tonight and to tell us. In short, we must recognize we are not standing neutral in life. We often think we are. We go through the days and the days drift one after the other and we think we're just kind of being neutral. We'll get to some of the stuff tomorrow. So days pass by and we think, well, I haven't moved anywhere. That's a lie, brothers and sisters. We're either moving forwards or we're drifting backwards. And the author wants us to realize that the most important thing for us as each day comes is that we are tasked with taking up the race again and running well. Brothers and sisters, we must be honest, in the Western church, and not just simply out there, but within our own walls, most Christians nowadays treat the race of faith with the same level of intentionality and seriousness and planning as I treated that half marathon several years ago. If I can just say a word to the men in this room, God help us if we are found to be saying that the Christian life and the duties that are placed on us as husbands and fathers are abdicated because we say things like we did not have enough time or life was too busy. We could not engage in things like scripture reading, family worship, praying with our spouses, leading our children in the ways they should go. God help us if we use the excuse that there's just too much going on and I don't have enough time. Our schedules would betray us, brothers. And so we must pick up the task of running well. There is a call in this text to the life of holiness and the life of walking with Christ in step with the Spirit each and every day of our lives. We see two main reasons for it. First, there's a need for it in Scripture. I love J.C. Ryle in his book, Holiness, goes to the end of time and imagines heaven, says so many Christians are longing for heaven, but they have no desire to take up the race of faith seriously right now. Holiness is not a priority in their lives. And Ryle asked the very sharp question, 
What kind of fellowship will you have in heaven? Everyone there is holy. If you do not desire and enjoy holiness now, what will you seek to enjoy when you arrive? If holiness is not the priority of your souls today, why do you think you would enjoy heaven? There's a need for holiness and a need for the seriousness of faith, but there's also a joy in it, brothers and sisters. Simply put, when we talk about the gospel, we are saved from sin and condemnation in Jesus Christ and the work of the cross. But we are saved to everlasting life and a relationship with God, having been restored into the ways in which we were designed to live, namely fellowship with the living God. Holiness is how we were made to live. It is where the greatest joy is to be found. It is where the greatest desire is to be found. Simply put, if you want the good life, brothers and sisters, pursue holiness. Run the race well. And you will find yourself saying with the words of the psalmist of Psalm 1, blessed is the man who takes delight in the law of the Lord, who meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree that's planted by a stream of water. In season he bears fruit and his leaf does not wither. That is what we seek to be. But my assumption as I look out into a crowd this size is there are going to be several of you, if not many and most of you, who are feeling the weightiness of this call and there's part of you in the back of your head saying, I feel like I've blown it. Perhaps men, in this moment, we can own up to one another and we can say, we have not shepherded our families the ways we have she- should have shepherded our families. And so what do we do if we've blown it? If we have woken up and we say, I have not been running the race. I have not been taking with seriousness and with the appropriate intentionality this task of the Christian. I've, I've just been laying the day's waste away. I've not been serious in the race of faith. What are you to do? And my mind goes immediately to Joel 2. You remember Joel chapter 2? The prophet Joel speaking to the people who have been rebellious. God allows suffering to go into the camp in the ways of locusts going and eating the harvest. And they just annihilate everything. And the people lament and they weep. And Joel in Joel chapter 2 verse 25, God speaks after seeing the repentance of the people. And he says, I will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. I will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. And so brother, sister, if today you find yourself under the conviction of the Spirit that you have not been running the race well, and you look over days, weeks, months, even years of life, you say, I have not been doing what I ought to be doing. God is able tonight to restore those years and to redeem the time of life that's been wasted and to use you in great capacity for His service and for your joy. And so this is the call in Hebrews chapter 12, but there's another place the author wants us to look. We've looked at ourselves, we realize this is the task, but there's a context, a very specific context that the author is putting us in that he wants us to see because it has a very particular helpful reason to help us run with endurance. Let's look at the context of this race. You'll notice verse 1 begins with the word, therefore. Now, I use this fun little saying often. You've probably heard me say, if you see the words there, for, or for, you need to ask, what are they there for? Because those words often are trying to summarize an argument. They're they're bringing to conclusion something that's just been articulated. In this chapter, chapter 12, comes right after chapter 11. I know that's profound. But chapter 12 comes right after chapter 11. And if you were to just glance over to chapter 11, you would see that this is the so-called Hall of Fame of Faith. It's often referred to kind of tongue-in-cheek as the Hall of Faith. It goes through all the by-faith stories and goes through all the, the main characters in the Old Testament and shows how by faith they were able to endure and carry on. And so the author of Hebrews in chapter 12 begins by giving this command, by setting it in the context of verse 1, by saying, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin and run with endurance. The context of the race is happening surrounded by what he calls a cloud of witnesses, namely all of the saints in chapter 11. This is the hall of faith, these great saints, this testimony of faith. But as we look at the chapter 11 crowd, this cloud of witnesses, we recognize these witnesses can be functioning in one of two ways. John Owen, the old Puritan writer, said there are two main ways you can understand these witnesses. First is that they are testifying to something that's happened in the past. 
That's one way witnesses testify. They say, this is what happened, we're giving our testimony. Owen says, the second way is to understand is they are testifying to something that will take place. And Owen and the other Puritans and many other biblical scholars tend to place the emphasis on the second interpretation rather than the further. That the point of these saints in chapter 11 is trying to talk about what's coming and what is going to be done, not simply what has been done. Now we need to stop and think for a moment because our ways of understanding things like Hall of Fames are kind of skewed. Going back to sports for the minute, if you think of Hall of Fame, we think you played a sport, you were very successful, you accomplished a great statistical career, and you are enshrined as one of the greatest who's ever played the game. That's how we think Hall of Fame. You can pick your sport. It can be baseball, you batted over 300 average, you had 500 home runs, you had over 300 wins as a pitcher. It could be football, you had so many wins and Super Bowls. But either way, we think if you accomplish much, you get put in the Hall of Fame. And so when we can read chapter 11, we can hear all these stories, and we can walk away almost intuitively thinking, well, if we just do our part and we live the Christian life well enough, maybe we one day can be the kind of Christian that gets listed in a Hall of Fame like that. So we just need to be more intentional as Christians. We need to live greater lives as Christians because we want to someday be considered for the Hall of Fame, if you will. Owen says it doesn't work like that. And the fact of this being a cloud of witnesses for us testifying what's going to happen is really trying to turn our eyes away from what's taken place, but rather what can happen through these witnesses. Simply put, all of these witnesses, if you go read their stories, are flawed people. Now, that's not hard to believe, but if you go read their stories, what you'll find is people who are very complex, flawed, sinful, strugglers, but those who had faith in God. And when they were faced with the toughness of this life, the trials that came, and they were task with either giving up or giving in or believing God, even when it cost them dearly, even their own lives, they placed their faith with God, even though they couldn't see the way forward. And all of these witnesses are proclaiming something, namely, not that they themselves are something great and now have ascended to a hall of fame, if you will, but they're all testifying to the God who is great, who's able to sustain and to keep you as you run this race well. That no matter what you face in this life, no matter what's coming at you, no matter the challenges that you are perceiving on the horizon, God is greater than them all. And if you will simply have faith in him, no matter what else may come through it, no matter what God might allow you to go through it, God will bring you to the finish line. That is the point of chapter 11. These are the cloud of witnesses around us. And so using the race imagery, if we will, if you are the one running the race, The crowd of witnesses, this cloud, are the runners along the road holding up their signs. They're holding up their signs, and all of them say, God kept me. God sustained me. God led me. God gave me strength. God helped me to endure. God didn't let go of me. God forgave me. God used me. And all of them are declaring something that will happen. Namely, you keep running, God's going to finish it. God's going to finish the race as you run this. So brothers and sisters, we need to see the crowd alongside of us. Look at the saints of old and see how God has worked through them. Do this in the Old Testament, do this in the New Testament. Look at Peter, look at Paul, look at all the saints throughout the scriptures. But then look at the saints in church history. The saints who were flawed and sinful and strugglers yet remained faithful in Christ despite the odds, despite the cost and see how God never failed them. There's one last place the author wants us to look. If you're running a race and if you are a runner, you know the place you want to keep your eyes is on the finish line. You want to keep your eyes on the finish line or as we often say, you want to keep your eyes on the prize. Because you're running for a particular reason, namely you're running to finish. And this is what the author wants to end with. Verse 2, he's had us look at us, he's had us look at the crowd, and now in verse 2 he says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We could spend an hour unpacking this one verse. If you guys want to hang out, I'm, I'm totally for it. But very quickly, let's work through this verse together. The author wants us to take our eyes and keep them on Jesus, 
who in this picture has the, the crowd of witnesses along the, the path as we're running the race. Jesus is standing at the finish line, having already gone before us and finished the race. And he's saying, keep your eyes on him. Keep your eyes on him. And he goes to describe this Jesus. He's described as the founder and perfecter of our faith. The word founder, depending on the translation you're using, can be described differently. Another translation for that word is pioneer. I think that's actually a more helpful word because it describes what the author is trying to get after. Namely, Jesus has gone before us. He's run the race already. He finished it. He's the pioneer. He's the founder. He's the trailblazer, as one commentator said. He's not called you to run a race that he hasn't already run himself. He's already gone before you. He set the path, and so now you are to follow him. But he's also the perfecter of our faith. Simply put, he is the finisher of the faith. He finished the race, and by his grace and by his power, he will give you the strength to finish yours. He is the perfecter of our faith. But notice Jesus endured a great race himself. You'll notice it says he endured the cross, despising the shame. Jesus himself ran the hardest of races imaginable. He ran the race that none of us could dare imagine running. But Jesus ran the race, and we are told why. Just before he is describing the endurance he gave, it is said, he, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. We have to ask the question, what's the joy set before Jesus? I wonder how you would answer that tonight if someone asked, what, what's the joy that's set before Jesus? There's many different good answers that we can throw out there. Let me give you just one. I think Jesus saw the joy before him as the finishing of the work his father had him to do. That's summarized at the end of our passage even, when we are told that Jesus now is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He finished the work, he sat down. There's no more work to be done. But what is the work Jesus was sent to do? Jesus was sent to reclaim sinners to salvation. So what is the joy as Jesus is on the road to the cross, as he is suffering and trying to endure, as he has a cross on his back and he's almost giving weight to the, sin, to the, the pain and the suffering that he is feeling? What is the joy that is before Christ as he continues going on? It's you and me, brothers and sisters. The joy set before Jesus is that we might be reclaimed from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. And so on one day, his prayer from John 17 might be true, that we might be where he was and that we all might be one just as he and the Father are one. Simply put, brothers and sisters, the joy before Jesus is that he might bring many brothers and sisters to glory. Jesus endured the cross. He despised the shame, but he did so because of the joy that was coming. Jesus is shown throughout the whole book of Hebrews to being the one who is greater than all things that have come before him. But simply put, the author of Hebrews goes out of his way to showcase something, that Jesus knows what it's like to run a hard race. Jesus knows what it's like to run this difficult race. He's spoken of earlier in the book as a high priest who's able to sympathize with our weaknesses and so being one that we can go to and ask for help in our time of need. He is a sensitive, sympathizing high priest who knows what it's like to go through what you're going through, brothers and sisters. To know what it's like to face agony and sheer pain and struggle and doubt. He knows what it's like to endure the hardest of races, and yet he knows what it's like to be faithful even unto death. And he calls us to do the same, not in the same way, though, because Jesus tasted the hardest of races so that we might be victorious in ours. And so surrounded by the crowd of witnesses, declaring what God has done in and through them, saying that he is faithful and he is worthy, that he won't let us down, he won't drop us, that he will sustain us, and turning our eyes up towards Jesus at the finish line, focusing in on him, we hear the author of Hebrews declare to us in this safe and steady place, run. Run to him. Run for him. Run in the joy of Him. Run knowing that the holiness of God is the greatest task we face. He stands with arms open wide, brothers and sisters. He beckons us to come home. And when we see Him, He will surround us with His arms. I don't know if you've thought about that day when you see Jesus face to face. 
I don't know what you plan to say. I can't help but to think my first words coming out of my mouth will be, I'm so sorry. And he will embrace us and tell us this is the joy that was set before me. And so, brothers and sisters, for the joy set before you, run and run well. The race is short. It will finish soon. And one day we will stand in glory and we will all talk about the race that we ran. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight and we ask for your grace for the many ways in which we have fallen short to run this race well and yet we find ourselves collapsing into the arms of Christ, finding our hope and our safety and security in Him and Him alone. So God, we pray, would you help us to see the glory of Christ, Him in all of His beauty, all of His worth, all of His value. Help us to see all of the testimonies throughout all of church history proclaiming your faithfulness and your goodness and your steadfast love. And help us, Lord, to run well. We pray, God, that you would help us to do this, that you might be glorified and our joy might be complete. We ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Amen and amen.